Hi, I'm Dan Elliott, and welcome to the next part of this series looking at spline components and spline mesh components. In the last video, we looked at how to create a spline component within a custom actor blueprint, and how to edit splines in our scene. Now we'll look at how we can use those splines to place geometry procedurally. First we'll need to have a static mesh available in our project that we want to have placed. Since we've included starter content, we can use one of the static meshes from the content browser. I'm just going to go under props and have a search for a suitable mesh. And I'm going to choose this SM Rock static mesh. I'm just going to have a quick preview of it in our scene so we can have a look and see what it, what it looks like. So we don't need this in our scene as we'll be creating it in the blueprint. So I'm just going to enter the previously made blueprint and all of our work is going to be done in the construction script graph. So all we need to do is come to our graph tab and then enter our construction script. In order to place our mesh, we have to have a way to control how many we want to place along the spline. So the first thing we need to do is find out how long the spline is in the first place. There is a function we can call that will return that result for us. So we'll drag out a reference to our spline in the construction script. We'll choose get. Then we'll drag out a pin from the spline reference. And because this list of available functions is context sensitive, we can start typing to find the function we want. If I start typing get spline, we can see there's a get spline length function. And this is the one we want. So I'll click on that, and that will get created in the construction script for us. Then we want to work out how many meshes we want to place by dividing the spline length by a fixed distance, which we can say is the size of our static mesh. We can visualize this by sketching out a spline that we'll say is 20 units long. And if we had a static mesh that, let's say, was 5 units wide, to find out how many we could place along this spline, all we need to do is divide 20 into 5. And simply dividing 20 by 5, we could work out that we could place 4 static meshes on this particular spline. So we need to calculate this bit of math in our blueprint. Let's create a variable which will represent our fixed spacing. So we'll call this spacing and we'll make it a float. And let's drag out a reference into our construction script. I'm going to make this visible so we can edit this from the details panel in the editor. So now to do a little bit of math, all we need to do is drag out from one of the uh, one of the pins. And if we start typing in divide, we can either choose divide float by float or we can choose division whole and remainder. I'm going to choose division whole and remainder because we're only interested in the integer division and not the remaining value. So we'll divide those two up. Out of this node, we've now calculated how many meshes we can place. We, ne we now need a way to iteratively create meshes and place them along the spline. The way we do this is with a for loop. So we can create a for loop by right-clicking in the graph and typing for loop. And there it is. We'll start the loop at index 0, and we'll end at the number of meshes that we can place by connecting up the value we calculated before. This loop will execute starting from index 0 all the way up to this number that we calculated. And what we want to do is in this loop body that gets fired every time, we want to call a function that's going to create a static mesh component for us. And the function we're going to call is called add static mesh component. What this function does is, instead of adding a component in this drop-down menu and adding a static mesh, 
what we're doing is using the blueprint to create that on the fly in the graph. So we can choose which static mess we want to create by selecting the add static mesh component node, coming down here and choosing the static mesh we want. Or there's another way of doing that, which is if we create another node, there's another one called, and this is where we need to untick context sensitive because sometimes all the all the nodes don't get shown. But we can choose set static mesh, and the target for this is going to be the static mesh component that we just created in each loop. And we'll connect up the execution pin so that gets fired. And then in this drop down, we can choose the static mesh that we want to get added into this static mesh component. So we'll just find the SM rock because that's the one we want. And the last thing that I want to do while we're in this part of the execution chain is I want to uh, set up a material on the static mesh. So we can choose set material. The target is, is going to be the static mesh component that we created. We'll hook up the execution pin so that gets fired. And the material that we want to assign to that static mesh component we can choose anyone that's in the starter content. So I'm going to choose M underscore rock sandstone. The next thing I want to do is make sure that our spacing variable has been initialized to a sensible value. So I'll do a quick compile to enable us to set a default value. And I'm just going to choose 5 as a default. And then I'll simply connect up the construction script event to the for loop so that when we place our our blueprint this loop will execute for as many times as we can divide the spacing variable into the length of the spline. So we'll recompile and we'll have a look at look in our scene. And we can see that our spline actor is indeed creating static mesh components. But what's happening is that they're all getting placed at the origin, they're all at the center of the world. And the reason for that is because we haven't actually set where they should be in the world. So let's do that now. We need to work out a position in the world along the spline for where we want to place these meshes. On the static mesh component node, there is a relative transform input. This is where we need to specify where the newly created mesh will get placed. It takes an input type, which is a transform. If we drag out a pin to the left, we can create a make transform node. Here it is. This makes sure that the data gets formatted in, in the right way and fed through to the add static mesh component node. So if we feed this into the add static mesh component, they'll still be created at the location specified here, which is 0, 0, 0. And we need a way to be able to get a world position based upon where along in the spline we want the static mesh to be. Luckily, there's a function which we can call on a spline, which will give us that location. If we right click in the, in the graph editor and we type spline, will be taken to the list of all the functions that, be, that can be called on splines. And the one we want to call is, is get world location at distance along spline. And what we can do here is it returns a vector, which is, a, which is the world location that we want. We need to plug a couple of things into it first. The first thing is the actual spline that we want to query. And the second one is the distance along the spline at where we want to grab the world position. And the way that we calculate that value is we want to we want to start at zero length along the spline and then incrementally sample at distances which are equal to the spacing variable. So what we can do is 
in each loop execution, we can get the index, which starts at 0, and we can multiply that, which is an int, by a float, because we're multiplying this integer index by a float variable, we can multiply it by our original spacing. And this will give us the correct value in each for loop execution. So we can plug this into the distance. And then if we connect the return value to the location, now if we compile, we can see that there is in fact um, multiple static mesh components being created along the length of the spline. But at the moment we can see there's too many. So because we made this spacing variable uh, visible, we can um, start to increase this and increase that spacing along the curve at which we're creating these static mesh components. So if we keep increasing this until we get a, um, a sensible value, and it's probably a good idea if we drag out these splines so we can get um, more on there and we can increase that even more. So we can see now that at 130 units along the spline we're creating um, new static mesh components and if we even drag out the spline longer then this construction script re-executes and recalculates how many we can place along the spline. If we now go and try and move our blueprint we'll see that as we move the blueprint around all the static mesh components that we've created are getting a doubling up of the transform so if I move the blueprint 10 units in X the static mesh components are getting moved 20 units and the reason for that is because when we're adding a static mesh component it's going to get parented to the default scene component and because we're moving that in the scene anyway, it's getting two values of transform and it's inheriting it twice. So what we want to do is come down to the add static mesh component and there's this ball manual attachment variable which tells the static mesh component to not attach the static mesh that it's created to the root component. So if we click this on and recompile We'll go to our blueprint, we'll move it, and we can see now that it's not getting attached to the root component, and it's now being placed firmly where, where we told it to. The next thing we can see is that there's no relationship between the mesh orientation and the orientation of the spline mesh component that we've, that we've created. That's also something we can fix in the blueprint. If we come along to where we grab the world location at distance along spline, we can get another node, and if we again filter to the spline section, we can get world rotation at distance along spline. And if we set the target to be the same spline and sample it at the same distance, then we're now going to be returned a rotation value at that point in space and we can just plug it right into our make transform node that we had there previously and if we compile and look at our scene we can see that the, um, the static mesh now gets the right rotation from the spline where, at where it was created now this would be good if you wanted a repeating pattern of geometry that followed the spline but what if you wanted a bit more variation all of the meshes are looking rather uniform because they're all facing the same direction. To add a bit of variation in there, we can create a random number in the range between 0 and 360, which will be the angle that we want to rotate each mesh by. So if we come along and create a... If we right-click and start searching, we can type random, and the one we want is random float in range and we can create this variable to be between 0 and 360 and from this random float in range we're going to want to create a rotator
So we can we can make rot make rot. This will create a rotator. And by default, it gets connected to the pitch. We actually want to connect this to a particular axis, which is the yaw, and that will spin the rock on its axis. So now, if we connect this make rot to the rotation, we're now replacing this rotation. We can compile. And we can see that now each rock is getting its own random rotation. But the, the thing is, is that every time we move this, move the component, the construction script is getting run again, and that random value is getting reset. So one thing we can do to fix that is we can create a variable, and we'll call it random stream, and the type that we want to make this is called random stream and what this does is it makes sure that random values that we create in the graph are going to be the same every time so to use that random stream we have to instead of random floating range we have to use random floating range from stream so we will delete this one again set the value to be 360 and we're going to be using that random stream variable we created, which makes sure that all the values are consistent and repeatable. So we'll connect that up to the yaw. We will compile. And hopefully now, we'll see that each time we move the spline and the construction script gets run, these random rotations are staying the same. And we can even combine these rotations so we get the best of both worlds. There's actually, a known, there's actually a node called combine rotators, and it takes two rotators as input and combines the, the transform so that both have an effect. So we'll compile, and now we get the rotation from the spline, and we also get random rotation. And now we can drag out as many points as we want and the placement tool should still work. I hope that this covers most of what you need to know about spline components. Feel free to add comments if you are unsure about anything or want to ask any questions. We'll be looking at spline mesh components in the next video, which are a powerful way of deforming geometry along splines. Thanks for watching.